muted. Welcome to CUGH's webinar series. My name is Keith Martin, the Executive Director of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this and a series of, of our webinars. Today's uh, webinar will be on interprofessional global health competencies. When CUGH was created in 2008, one of its goals was to define the field and discipline of global health to standardize the required curricula and competencies for global health and define those criteria and conditions for student and faculty exchanges and promoting coordination of projects and initiatives in this area. And one of the ways in which we've done this is to create a series of committees. And one of our most active committees is the Education Committee and its subcommittee, the Global Health Competencies Committee. And I have to say that this particular subcommittee that was chaired by Linda, Professor Linda Wilson and who will be handing over that chair to Dr. Jessica Ebert has been one of our most active. It's been defining and creating groundbreaking work in defining what those competencies are for global health programs. So I want to welcome you to this. I want to thank you for attending this particular session. I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Jessica Ebert, who's going to moderate this, and Professor Virginia Robottom from University of Maryland, Baltimore, Dr. Quentin Eichbaum from Vanderbilt University, and Dr. Ashley Duby Prasad. They've done a fantastic job. I hope you enjoy today's webinar. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Jessica Ebert and thank her very much for moderating this particular session. Jessica, over to you. Thank you, Keith. What a pleasure to be here today. This has been such a labor of love for so many of us that are on the subcommittees you mentioned. And we have a really star-studded lineup. The importance of today is that we're going to really go beyond just the competencies that have been published and dig into some of the consensus and the controversies that exist. So I welcome you to this hour, which I think will be very productive for all of us. A few housekeeping items that I want to mention. Later in the hour, we're going to have time for discussion and Q&A. And if you see your control panel that you have on the right side of your screen, you're actually going to be able to type questions into the question box, which is um, in a drop-down menu at the bottom half of that control panel. So when you type questions in, if you would, mention your name and where you at uh, where you are at um, institutionally, if you're uh, willing to, so that we can take your questions and then I'll be help helping moderate the question and answer session. Um, if you have any challenges, um, you can uh, go ahead and um, type in any questions as far as logistical challenges as well. So thank you for joining us. Without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Virginia Rothorn, who's going to speak to us a bit about the background and evolution of the competency and interprofessionalism movement. Welcome, Virginia. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Um, I am um, the co-director of the Center for Global Education Initiatives at University of Maryland in Baltimore. And I'm going to give some background about um, competencies generally and also about interprofessional education and the synergy between the two. So first of all, um, just what is a competency? Um, competencies are used in the workplace and in educational institutions to express a standard level of performance that can be assessed to measure if the competency has been achieved. And these are often framed in terms of knowledge, skills, and attitudes, or KSAs. Now, it's important to remember that competency statements are not wish lists or lists of content topics, but they describe what would be considered an acceptable level of performance and the skills needed to perform at that level. Also, it's important to remember that a listing of competencies is not a curriculum, but rather it's used to facilitate the process of developing a curriculum. Next slide, Jessica. So in terms of um, competencies in the area of global health education, um, one thing, just as I'm sure you all know, is that um, global health, interest in global health among students in high-income countries has increased greatly in the past decade. So according to CUGH, comprehensive university-based global health programs have increased from six in 2001 to 78 in 2011, uh, probably more now, 
with approximately 250 North American universities having global health education offerings. So that rapid growth um, sort of led to this haphazard expansion that has resulted in a lack of agreed upon definitions and failure in some cases to standardize curricula and competencies. And others have argued that um, many global health curricula have poorly defined goals and objectives. And that really gives you the reason why there's been a push, as Dr. Martin mentioned, to develop competencies and consistency in uh, global health curricula. So a lot of work has been done in individual professions in the last few years, um, such as nursing, medicine, and dentistry, to develop global health competencies. And I've put a link here to um, the competency matrix for global oral health by Dr. Mohammed Benzian at NYU uh, School of Dentistry, the um, global health competencies for nurses that Dr. Linda Wilson, who's a member of CUGH, uh, developed with her colleagues. And then moving to the next slide, you'll see um, a listing of uh, different efforts that have been made by medical schools to create global health competencies. And this is a listing um, of different um, efforts over the years to define global health competencies for medical students. This list appeared in an article by Omar, Omar Khan and his colleagues in a uh, 2013 BMC Medical Education Journal. Uh, his group reviewed these competencies and said that while they exist, Unfortunately, there was uh, little uniformity in the way medical schools were actually employing these uh, different global health guidelines. And in that article, they recommended a basic curriculum applicable to all medical students in global health with progressively more advanced electives available as the student became more interested in pursuing a career in global health. So those are the individual professions. Um, and uh, next slide, uh, Jessica. I'm, now I'm going to move into where the competencies um, have become interprofessional and, and trying to uh, create a set of competencies that will work for all the professions uh, that work in global health. So as global health has expanded, we've also realized, we, we've all known, but it's become articulated that Global health addresses complex factors that contribute to health of individuals, and it requires the participation of a broad range of professionals from health and non-health disciplines. And this is obviously the interprofessional approach. And this interprofessional approach is reflected in the most commonly current accepted definition of global health, which is Copeland's definition, and he says that global health emphasizes transnational health issues and determinants and solutions and involves many disciplines within and beyond the health sciences and promotes interdisciplinary collaboration. So with this mandate and this realization that global health requires an interprofessional approach, there's been a push in the last few years to develop interprofessional global health competencies. Of course, universities, for lots of reasons, have been slow to adopt um, interprofessional interprofessional educations and institutions remain highly siloed for the most part. Um, there can be several professional schools on a single campus, each with their own global health program um, as a sign that they're not necessarily talking to each other. So there was a wonderful effort by the American Schools and Programs of Public Health, um, it's now known as ASPPH, I believe, uh, in 2011 to create um, global health competencies. Now, I don't know if you can read at the bottom, but they specifically note that this listing of global health con uh, competencies is applicable to schools of public health, but also other schools, including international relations and affairs, business schools, law schools, and other health profession schools, such as medicine and nursing. So this was a great effort to move forward with interprofessional global health competencies. Um, likewise, CUGH supported a project by Dr. Linda Wilson that Dr. Evert's going to talk about in a few minutes um, to define interdisciplinary core content ex expected of all global health programs. 
So this fantastic effort uh, was published recently in the Annals of Global Health uh, last year. Also, my colleague Jody Olson and I uh, built on this uh, project by the CUGH Education Subcommittee to create a team skills competency framework to help students successfully employ their substantive knowledge as part of an effective global health team. And I put the citation there. Um, when we started this project on interprofessional global health, we borrowed heavily from the um, next slide, Jess. Um, world of interprofessional education, or IPE. So um, when we thought about how can we get global health teams uh, and practic practitioners to work together, we know that this model existed. And IPE is uh, an approach to teaching clinical teamwork to improve patient outcomes. And there's been a, quite a big movement, just as global health has grown across, uh, grown rapidly in universities, so has IPE. And IPE is defined by the World Health Organization as when students from two or more professions learn about, from, and with each other. And the ultimate goal of IPE is interprofessional practice or collaborative practice, which the WHO defines as when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds work together with patients, families, caregivers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care. Um, in terms of the benefits of IPE, they've been identified in multiple sources, uh, but the World Health Organization, I thought, did a great job of defining the benefits here. It's to develop the ability of students to share knowledge and skills collaboratively, to help different categories of health workers assess their own and other strengths, limitations, and work patterns, and different ways in which they can contribute to the solution to promote an environment of respect, and to promote collaborative interprofessional research, often in new or previously neglected areas, to ensure all pertinent aspects of the problem are considered. In uh, 2011, the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, also known as IPEC, did a wonderful job uh, creating core competencies for interprofessional collaborative practice. And this uh, collaborative is made up of the associations of colleges of medicine, nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, osteopathic medicine, public health, and nursing. And they, uh, they created this report that identified four interprofessional competency do domains, um, values and ethics for interprofessional practice, roles and responsibilities, interprofessional communication, and teams and teamwork. So within each of these four domains are listed 10 to 12 specific competencies. And on the next slide, I, I won't go through this in depth, but I wanted you to see um, what the uh, framework looks like. So these are the four domains I just mentioned. Domain one is values and ethics. Within that are several competencies that students should be expected to master. So for instance, VE1, Values and Ethics 1, is place the interests of patients and populations at the center of interprofessional healthcare delivery, and so on. So for each of their domain, these domains, there are lists of competencies that we expect and hope students will master in the, in the course of their professional education. So when Dr. Olson and I embarked on our project to think about team skills or interprofessional education for global health, one thing we became aware of, me as a lawyer and Dr. Olson as a social worker, was that um, these IPEC competencies are really not sufficiently adapted for global health education because they really focus heavily and as they should on health professional students and as a way to improve clinical care. But this is less useful for global health teams that may include non-health professions such as law, engineering, and business where policy or regulatory change rather than clinical care are the primary goals. So uh, as part of a project with uh, global health faculty and administrators across the country, we created a um, 
team skills competency domain, which you can see a snippet of on the right, which is designed to help uh, global health students uh, work together in, in a uh, in, in apply these team building values to their project goals. So um, on that note, that was a background as we prepare to hear more specifics about competency efforts and controversies, and I will turn it back over to Dr. Jessica Everett. Thank you, Virginia. That was so helpful. So um, as the next step in the evolution of the development of global health competencies, this seminal article was published um, mid last year, uh, and thank you to Dr. Linda Wilson for uh, chairing this effort. And so it is uh, available in Annals of Global Health. It's an open source publication. I'm sure many of you have seen it. I just want to give you a quick kind of run through of how to maybe consider utilizing it and understanding a little of the background on this effort. So this effort was basically an iterative consensus building process and we looked at over two dozen sets of competencies and sources for competencies. And what we did um, along the way was develop four levels of proficiency. And this is, I think, really important piece of this work because before, and Quentin will get into some of this, we were kind of operating on the competent, incompetent, black, white, um, you know, you have it or you don't have it. And this is the first kind of codified effort uh, in, the, in the literature to say that this is a stepping stone process. And, um, and so the four levels, I'll just quickly overview them. The first is the global citizen level. And this level is really exciting because it is proposed that all post-secondary students, so all university students pursuing any field with bearing on global health, have this level of competency. And as we know, based on Schroeder's work and the Copland definition and many other things, many or most fields have bearing on global health. So this is a powerful um, set of competencies that we're basically saying all post-secondary students should understand this minimum, um, have this minimum set of understanding skills and attitudes. Um, and then the second level is an exploratory level. And this paper did not set the competencies for the exploratory level. I think that will be forthcoming. Um, but this is a, a level of competency for students who are um, considering future pursuits in global health and preparing for a global health field experience. Importantly, you can see here that it says a global health field experience working with individuals from diverse cultures and or socioeconomic groups. It does not say international field experiences. And so this is really in recognition of the importance of global, um, of local global health and global health um, activities that happen regardless of geographic location. And I think what that boils down to is really activities, experiences, learning, and perhaps service that's happening in settings where the um, culture or the socioeconomic level or the resource level or the geopolitical or historical context is very different from the student's frame of reference. And so we're really talking about venturing out of, of comfort zones and of, of environments where the student may have inherent uh, level of, of efficacy because of their um, the way they were raised or where they grew up or the resource level or the culture that they're used to. The third level is a basic operational level, and so this is basically for students or professionals that are planning on spending a moderate amount of time, but not necessarily an entire career working in the field of global health. And there were two subcategories to this, the practitioner-oriented, which is really more of what either the clinical or profession-specific competencies, and this paper did not go into these, but, Lynn, but Virginia did show you the nursing competency set and other competency sets that have come out that are discipline-specific. And so that's more about that level. But this paper did define the program-oriented operational level, which is kind of 3B category. And then the level four is the advanced level for those kind of spending an entire career working um, outside their frame of reference. And further, this paper went on to um, to lay out domains of global health competency. And I'm not going to go into these, but just to show you kind of how the competency is broken down. It's, it's per these 11 domains. And then what we did is basically through an iterative process define the competency level um, for both the um, global citizen level and the basic operation program oriented level. And you can see an example of the uh, table one that can be very helpful. And then we also you know, tried to define whether it was knowledge 
attitude or skills. Um, and so this paper can be very useful for those of you that are building global health education programs. And I think it will be helpful to hear from someone who's actually done that recently, utilizing this as a foundation. So I want to um, invite Ashji Dubey Prasad to join us. Um, Ashji's at Northwestern University and has been in involved in a variety of program development. Ashji, thank you for bringing your testimonial to us today. Thanks, Dr. Everett. So this is, um, we used the CUGH competencies in two of our programs I'll talk about very quickly. So the first one, um, which is on the next slide, is um, a graduate medical education certificate program that we developed. And so this is really for um, medical residents across different specialties. And when we were creating this, our goal was to offer a competency-based program that would train them for clinical care delivery in resource limited settings. And what we needed to do was we needed some competencies to help, uh, you know, some standardized competencies from the global health perspective, as well as the ACGME perspective. And so we actually created these using both the CUGH competencies as well as recommendations from the uh, global Health Training in Graduate Medical Education um, publication by Drs. Chase and Everett. So that, um, this goes through, if you look through the topics, it kind of goes through the didactics that we do. The program has several components in addition to the didactics. At the bottom, you can see I, I just added the skills practicum. It's a different, it's a simulation educational component. But we also use the competencies to define um, different educational approaches as well. Um, and then the second um, the second program that uh, we developed, so I'm sorry, I didn't actually let you know, I'm the Associate Director of Global Health Graduate Education. So that's why I'm involved in all of this graduate level programming. The second um, program that we developed uh, was a online Masters of Science in Global Health. And there, our target audience is really the sort of diverse, interprofessional, international workforce who we hope will commit to these careers in global health. And when we were creating this, we were in the process of creating it. It was fairly dynamic when the CUGH um, competencies were presented at the national meeting. And so, um, Dr. Linda Wilson actually shared her draft with us, and we used her draft to help kind of create our curricular, our curriculum components. And if you look across the top, you can see our courses are listed there, our practicum, biostatistics and epidemiology, global health systems, et cetera, et cetera. So we asked our faculty to use these competencies when they're creating their course goals and objectives. And then, um, actually, the paper was published. We, we launched the, the program in 2014. The paper was published in 2015 and had defined those levels that Dr. Everett mentioned, the 3B levels, which really actually fit with a lot of our students who are looking to, um, you know, run NGOs and really be program, uh, more involved in programmatics. So what we did is we actually used the CUGH competencies to then evaluate our program. So you'll see here the CUGH domains are um, on the left, and then we had it's a, we went through a kind of long process where we had folks um, kind of validate what competencies were being fulfilled. And you'll see um, this pie chart is our representation of the various domains across our course. And so we identified some gaps, and then we also validated this. It seemed like there were, it, it did really, it was really, it really represented what we were teaching our students, uh, things that, everything that was in the competency domains. And we also identified some unique um, additional competencies that we were teaching that maybe weren't represented around grant writing and global policy. Um, and at the moment, we are we're challenged uh, in two ways. We are currently trying to develop a kind of a portfolio global student evaluation based on the competencies um, as well as some of the fieldwork of the students. 
and I have just highlighted in green one of our courses here so you can see how we mapped it. So, um, for example, the global burden of disease is represented in our biostatistics and epidemiology course. And then the next slide shows, um, so, yeah, the next slide shows that it's highlighted here that we have the global distribution of, of the global burden of disease. So this is just to sort of show you how we did the mapping. But it was, um, it was very helpful. We had to grow these programs pretty quickly and we were looking for some kind of standardized competencies to use. We're now trying to figure out how we use them to evaluate our programs and all the other kind of unique components that are not represented in competencies, how how we can evaluate those, and that's sort of where we are on the practical end. Thank you so much, Ashti. That's really helpful. Next, I want to bring in someone who has emerged as a really important thought leader in the area of controversies uh, within the competency movement in global health education. Quentin Eichbaum is here from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He holds many positions and titles. Uh, he's also a pleasure to work with. Thank you for joining us, Quentin. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to join this. Um, so I come at this from a perspective, to some extent, of someone who grew up and was born in the developing world and um, look at this with the eyes both from the um, high-income countries and low-income countries. So I want to highlight what I think are some of the uh, areas in the field of competency development that I think haven't been resolved and are still controversial. And these derive in part from two publications, one of them, The Problem with Competencies in Global Health, recently published in Academic Medicine, and the second one coming out, which um, hasn't been published yet, and I'm not allowed to talk too much about it, but we'll touch on it, on a concept that I'm developing called Acquired and Participatory Competencies in Global Health Education. Next slide. Next. Oh. So the problems I want to touch on in this talk are basically four of them. And the first problem I see is the lack of inclusiveness of faculty and global health practitioners in low-income and middle-income countries in the global south. And I see the competencies often being developed um, by committees and programs sort of exclusively in high-income countries. Now, I'll define later on what, where I'm coming from with high-income and low-income and middle-income countries. And sometimes those programs are serve primarily, I think, the interest of the of the programs themselves and to a lesser extent, although clearly not exclusively, the interest of, of the developing country. The second controversy I want, would like to highlight is that in many cases, and we're getting there, things are getting better, and I laud the attempts of the CUGH, and I'm on the competency committee there, um, to make these competencies more context-specific. Often I find they are generic, and they're generic to the extent that they can be transferred across different contexts in different countries. But what we need to work towards is to make these competencies much more context specific. The third problem I see is what I call the individualist collectivist disjunction, and I'll explain that more. What is meant by that, there's a lot that's been written about different approaches to learning in, in these contexts. And fourthly, I'll touch on what I think are the inadequate methods of assessment. Now, some may argue, and I think there's some validity to it, the competencies don't always need to be assessed, but there is also a strong movement that drives learning, and I think that is an important component of it. Next slide. So let me just lay some, set the stage a little bit here and outline that I'm coming at this from a particular model of global health education, and I think it is currently a predominant model, and that is uh, high um, trainees from high-income countries doing elective work in low- and middle-income countries. And what I'll argue is that this often leads to what could be called learning dissonances. And I'm going to clarify these terms as I go on. But I'm aware that there are clearly other models of global health education, what we want to call local or global, they're long-term going on for years, is bi-directional, uh, you know, in education going on. But, and I'm also aware that some of the arguments that I outlay, as reviewers have pointed out, apply also in high-income countries, not only in low- and middle-income countries. So that's just to set the stage. Next slide. 
So just to highlight again the centrality of context, which I, I believe has not been sufficiently dealt with in the, in the, in the competency debate, and this is from the uh, very well-known Lancet document 2010, Julio Frank and 20 Luminaries in Global Health. All aspects of the educational system are deeply affected by local and global context. Although many commonalities might be shared globally, there's local distinctiveness and richness. So I think that is something we absolutely cannot lose sight of. Next slide. And where this impacts us in medical education, and part of my appointment is in medical education, so I come at this quite strongly from a, a theoretical stance from medical education, is that context can be either, is that competencies can be either viewed as being linked to a context or free of a context. And that takes some thinking about because if the competency is context free, then that means you can transfer that competency across different contexts. And I'll give examples of that. There clearly are things which you can learn and, and apply in the United States where you, you use them or in a developing country. So these kinds of competencies can be taught and practiced independent of the particularities of the context. So you can transfer them, and if you're competent in one context, that'll clearly predict that you'll be competent in another context. And that's clearly one type of competency, and those competencies exist. But there are other types of competencies that are closely linked to the context in which they are being practiced. And a practitioner is competent only with respect to specific contexts. So that competency must be linked and taught with respect to that particular context. And competence in one context doesn't predict that you'll be competent in another one. So you might be highly competent in a particular field, in a particular area, in a country that may apply in that context, but does not mean that you can transfer and that you'll be competent in another context, whether that is Canada or, or, or rural Kenya or, or Namibia or wherever. Next slide. So let me touch on the other theoretical side of this, and that is what has been called individualist approaches to learning and cultures or collectivist approaches to learning and culture. And there's a book which has done quite a lot of in this setting, and that's by uh, Geert Hofstede called Cultures and Organizations, and many others have, have written about this, but that's just one reference. And that is individualist cultures are mostly the high income countries like USA, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, what we commonly call the global north. And individualist uh, countries and cultures understand themselves primarily through individual achievement. They're intrinsically competitive. And in these cultures, we view learning as something you acquire and possess. And you write exams and you pass your boards and all of that. It's something you carry with you. And According to these, this approach of individualism, learning is transferable across contexts. If you learn something, you, can, <clears throat> you know it, you possess it, and you can use it wherever you like in the world. The other approach is the collectivist approach to learning, and that is primarily and permeates, and I, I have this in me, having grown up in Africa, um, from developing countries. And these cultures understand themselves primarily in terms of the group they belong to. To some extent, this is a concept a little bit foreign to us in, in developed countries, but these cultures are intrinsically participatory, collaborative, and they often place the group's wishes over their own. And in these collectivist settings, learning is viewed as being situated or distributed. That's a term from medical education. A lot of theory behind it, people like Lav and Wenger and a lot of other people have also developed notions of communities of practice. But here, learning is situated or distributed within, and it arises through participation and from dynamic social interaction. That, that takes a little bit of thinking about in, in our kind of setting where everything we view, everything is something the individual can learn. But in collectivist settings, learning is context dependent and is not fully transferable across contexts. Next slide. So, that that's, may sound a lot of uh, like a lot of theoretical background, but let me now get to what I see are the shortcomings of um, the assessment component of competencies in in low and middle income countries. So I lay out a couple of them here. 
The one is the inadequate direct observation to assess the competency. A lot has been written about this in, in our highly developed settings in tertiary hospitals. We cannot even here fully assess a competency because if we cannot directly observe it. Is that person competent requires, to some extent at least, that they are directly observed to be competent. In these low- and middle-income countries, there's often a lack of faculty, there are overcrowded hospitals, clinics, so that you cannot really assess that competency for a trainee from high-income countries going to work in a low- and middle-income country. And again, that's the model, as I stated, that I, I'm, I'm working with. The second shortcoming is that there's often a lack of a frame of reference to assess high uh, trainees from high-income countries, and that is we send students out with the assessment forms to these countries, and we ask the preceptor in the host country to fill it in and determine whether that particular trainee was competent. But often they don't know what that trainee who comes from a completely different setting is expected to know. They're not sure how they should compare alongside the local trainees, and they're not sure how to um, uh, what exactly they are supposed to be looking for in, in these in these trainees and how to assess them. So what we often find, and I found when I directed the global health electives here, is that students all return. Many of them return with excellent recommendations because the assessors in those countries aren't quite sure how to assess them and they don't want to create any uh, discord. And so I think we stand the risk there of, of, of engendering overconfidence in many of our trainees. Next slide. The third controversy, and this one is one that's pretty well known now, is that is the, the inadequacy of the checkbox format. And that's convenient. You get people to check off, are they competent in this, that, and the other. And it, it's just simplistic in many ways for assessment. I think it often leads to a recognition bias as well. People recognize themselves, and it's sort of a seen that, done that, and again leads to a, a hazard of overconfidence in trainees. The fourth controversy I'd lay out is that, and a lot has been written about this um, by thought leaders like Karachi in England, who have written a lot at the AAMC about competencies and ASH, and I'll touch on their writings. And that is that in many cases, the settings in low and middle income countries are not, so to speak, competent enough yet, or have not yet reached the same level of competence to assess an incoming trainee from a high income country. That doesn't only apply to LMICs, it even applies within high-income countries because Karachi and England have stressed the importance of the clinical microsystem in which one trains. And well-known experiments of Arthur Ashe showed with respect to obstetricians that the specific program and environment in which they trained had a very big impact on the subsequent competence of the trainee. So we can see that even in high-income countries, where you train and the general competency and level of the program exerts a big influence on your subsequent level of competence. So one can imagine that if a trainee is going into an LMIC and those programs are low resource, that we're putting them in a position to actually assess competencies that may either be completely context-specific and they can assess them, but in some cases may also not be accessible in those particular contexts. The fifth controversy is that we have not yet developed adequate continuing education for maintenance of competency. And this is in medical education, continuing medical education, and we're getting there, and I think CUGH's attempts are, are, are in, that, in that direction as well. But we all know the competencies wane over time. And in particular, the settings in LMICs can change very quickly. Epidemiologic patterns, sociopolitical changes can all lead to very big changes in those settings, and faculty and trainees who've done some time there may not maintain that competence unless it's assessed on a continuing basis, and that, again, can lead to overconfidence, and overconfidence is something that is being quite w well looked at in, in medical education. Next slide. Next slide. So the two concepts that I've developed are 
and this actually come the words come from work by Swad uh, a couple of many quite a few years ago. And that is, I think it would be useful to start dividing competencies into acquired competencies and participatory competencies because they require different methods of assessment. So an acquired competency would be one that along the lines of knowledge and skills, which sort of aligns more with an individualist approach to learning. It's something you can learn and take with you and transfer across contexts. So you can acquire it, you can have it with you, it's learnable. And just as an example, I took these randomly from ophthalmology, ACGME competencies. A medical knowledge competency would be, must demonstrate competencies in their knowledge of cataract surgery, contact lenses, corneal, and external disease, eye abnormalities, glaucoma. Well, we can see that that is something that you can learn. It's something you can acquire and possess and transfer, not, not absolutely entirely, but largely across contexts. So to me, that's an acquired competency. But when you get to another set of domains of competencies that I call participatory competencies, these are communication, collaboration, etc. And all the all the sets of competencies that I, as I will show, have these kinds of competencies in them. So from ophthalmology, the interpersonal communication skills says, must communicate effectively with patients, families, and the public as appropriate across a broad range of socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. Well, can you really acquire that? Like you learn an abdominal exam, can you carry that with you? No, to my mind, that is highly dependent on the particular context and the people you're dealing with. Next slide. So here's just an example, and where this struck me was I was at the MEPI meeting of PEPFAR 2014 in Maputo, Mozambique, and there was a workshop on um, competencies, and there were two competencies almost alongside each other, and one of them said something like, can interpret viral loads and CD4 counts in patients with HIV AIDS. Well, there's some context dependency there, but that is largely something you can learn and you can transfer across context. So that's an acquired competency. But another one, and this, this struck me at the time quite clearly, was counsel a dying patient. Well, is that a competency you can simply acquire and check off the box? And there was literally a box next to it and transfer across different contexts, because I would say no. Counseling a dying patient in a, in a hospice in the United States is a very, very different set of uh, uh, competency skills than counsel a patient dying of HIV in rural Africa. That is something that's highly context dependent and requires an understanding of, of the culture and interaction with the people in that particular setting. Next slide. So here are just um, I list four, four um, global and public uh, uh, co competency domain models from four major global public health organizations, and I won't go through them all, but they're from the ASPH, the World Health Organization, CUGH, and the Joint U.S.-Canadian Committee on Global Health Core Competencies. And those are just the domains, but if you look at them, some overlap, some are quite different, and there is, to varying degrees, more or less granularity within each of them. And they're a mix within those uh, subdomains of acquired and participatory competencies. And let me just clarify, I'm not saying that acquired are better or worse than participatory. They are just different and require different modes, modes of assessment. Next slide. <clears throat> so I think where we need to focus more of our attention is on assessing participatory competencies. We know how to assess acquired competencies. We, there's psychometric methods and observational methods, but participatory competencies are not amenable to these standard observational and psychometric methods of assessment. They require a multidimensional approach involving input from other co-assessing healthcare teams and individuals, and as I will argue, including the trainee can be involved in their own assessment. So it's not just a single pre preceptor observing the, the trainee. And there are many methods that are being developed along these lines, and uh, authors like Whitehead and Hodges and many others, Kevin Ever and these, have, have highlighted kinds of methods that can be used. Self-directed learning is a big one. There are narrative uh, approaches, ethnographic, realist inquiry, and, and several others. Next slide.
So one of them that I like and, and discuss is self-directed assessment seeking because I think this fits quite well with the collectivist cultures. And Eva and Rachel in 2008 discussed this as a, a type of assessment in which the trainee proactively seeks feedback. So the trainee seeks feedback and assessment from a range of relevant sources. And they are actually empowered by faculty in the system to do so and then they translate this feedback back into improving their own performance. So it's not just one person summatively observing and assessing the trainee, but the trainee interacts with uh, other people and is also empowered to, to seek this kind of assessment. So it's not purely individualistic. It involves peers, teachers, other sources of information. And recent publications have actually shown that this is actually a much more reliable form of assessment than just having one person assess the trainee. It also fits, I think, much better with these low-resource collectivist settings. And in particular, the Lancet document talked about uh, not just interprofessionalism, but transprofessionalism, in which you actually included in the whole global professionalism uh, setting the an ancillary workers as well. So they can also be involved and play a role in helping the trainee gain adequate assessment and feedback about their competency. Next slide. So just uh, as I'm ending off here, some of the other uh, components that self-directed assessment seeking aligns with, as I said, all the transprofessionalism. There's a concept I'm and developing called resourcefulness learning, which I think is what our trainees get out of working in low resource settings where they have to draw on all their uh, abilities to communicate with others when they don't have many resources to think creatively and be very resourceful. There's a concept I don't have time to get into, but Coriat has developed that called desirable difficulties where we put uh, trainees in settings which are difficult and that actually activates all their learning modalities rather as does not occur in a, in a very resource-rich setting. And then, as I, I'm also in, in this new paper talking about models and metaphors of sharing, too often we are sending our trainees out into these low-resource settings thinking we, they're fully competent and trained and we bring them back and ask them what they learned. We, there needs to be much more sharing with the people in these low-resource settings and a much more of a partnership in actually developing these competencies to get back to one of my early points, input from the Global South as well in, in determining what competencies are really about. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> so I just, I just want to touch on briefly, a lot has been said about cultural competence and that that is uh, the, the solution to all of this, but I, I don't think it is. I think it certainly go, helps quite a bit but I think it's often loaded with assumptions and, and perceptions, and there are complex intersections with individual identity and life experience, also with a lot of global movement. Um, the boundaries are being blurred, and one has to be very careful. I think we on this call all know this of stereotyping. So I think cultural competence is helpful, but it has certain hazards in it as well. The problem I see mostly with the way we are still teaching cultural competence is we are teaching it as an acquired uh, a competency like possessed knowledge rather than being participatory and situated. And this line by <coughs> Arno Kumaga and Lipson, uh, they've said quite pithily that culture is not an abdominal exam. So you cannot teach cultural competency just like an acquired competency. The alternate terms cultural humility and awareness I think are better, but they're still problematic and uh, don't have time to talk about that. But anyway, to conclude, um, I would say there are four, four things I would say that we need to focus very clearly on which competencies are context-free and which ones are, are context-linked. Some competency may be individually acquired as knowledge and skills, and they can be transferred across context. That can be use of, use of a stethoscope, a thermoscope. But there are others, and I think most of them are actually situated in dynamic social settings, and they are linked to context, and they are learned through participation. And those are the participatory competencies. So thirdly, uh, these acquired and participatory competencies require different methods of assessment. We cannot assess them by the same standard observational psychometric methods. And we need much more work on assessing participatory competencies. 
And then lastly, as I said in the beginning, we need to be much more inclusive and we need a more nuanced way of, of starting to gain more granularity and particularity about the competencies, not have them as generic lists. So thanks very much. I, I look forward to the discussion, Jessica. Thank you, Quentin. Um, so we're going to open the floor, the virtual floor, for questions. Um, if you would use, again, the question box in your control panel. Um, the first question comes to us from Sharon Rudy at Global Health Fellows Program and Public Health Institute. Quentin, um, Sharon's wondering, can U.S. or high-income country universities teach, actually teach the ability to identify and adjust to context in a general way? Because when trainees are trainees, we often don't know which contexts are going to be working in. So how do we um, adjust to that? Yeah, I think I think that that that's a good point. I mean, that this is why I, the approach that we use, if, if that's what she's asking, I don't think we can simply have a list that all our trainees going to 30 different countries can utilize wherever they go. So I think this is where I would draw the distinction that we need to say the acquired competencies can be transferred across those contexts. But I think we need to decide what is, where is that particular trainee going to go? Is it KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa? And what are they going to be doing there? And then I think we need input from people in those particular areas to determine what exactly is needed in that particular context. And that, that's where the sharing comes in and where the inclusiveness comes in. So I think we've just got to be wary of having these lists that people can put in their pocket and take with them and, you know, check off a, a box and say they're competent in that. I think it's going to require lists which are generic and then a sub-list sub which are not generic and which have to apply much more particularly to, to specific contexts. I'm not sure that does that answer the question? I think so. I think the question is how do we know what the contexts are when trainees are trainees and we don't exactly know where their context is going to be. And, you know, one thought that comes to mind for me at Child Family Health International, we have actually moved away from cultural competence toward cross-cultural effectiveness. And I wonder if you could reflect on the idea of cross-cultural effectiveness as, um, as something that can actually be acquired but can be adjusted to context. Yeah, I, I think I, I like that term more than uh, because the idea of effectiveness actually, to me, situates it a little bit more in being effective in that context. So um, rather than just the broad category of cultural competence, which which um, is, is susceptible to, to stereotyping, and that effectiveness can change with time as well. So as the situation on the ground can change that effectiveness, cross-cultural effectiveness can change as well. I also like the idea of putting the word cross in there because that doesn't mean that we're going to determine what that culture is about, but it requires a sharing and an interaction between the two uh, 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 contexts, the, the high income and the low income context. But the notion of adjusting is is you know tricky one's got to move away from doing this by committee in a high income country that we'll just adjust it i think we really need to develop ways in which there's much more dialogue between between the two settings so that the adjustment doesn't occur from one from the high income country and but from from both ends and you know even before people go into particular settings there needs to be more dialogue as to what what they're going into and what particular competencies needed and how they're going to be looked at and assessed so i, I agree I, I do like that term more yeah it's been helpful for us so linda wilson is joining us um, our fearless leader and she wanted to point out you know from the perspective of getting more input from the global south on what desirable competencies are she wanted uh, to mention the world federation of academic institutions in global health who uh, cugh is a founding member of that is working towards cross-cutting global health competencies with more of a inclusive voice i'll also point out that quentin and i um, as well as researchers from eight other countries are involved in the collaboration for host perspectives of global health competencies and that's a study that just closed and we expect the results um, in the next few months um, that got perspectives from over 30 countries on um, 
the competencies that TUGH has suggested as well as other general competencies. So do look out for that publication. Kate Conway comes to us with a question. Um, Virginia, perhaps you want to take this one. Can you expand a bit on the concept of global? I'm especially interested in working on teaching interprofessional students with refugee healthcare settings and issues. Thank you, Kate. Uh, that is a great question, and it's um, really right on my mind uh, right now because uh, I've been thinking about it, and we're having a meeting about it on Friday. And I've been listening to Quentin's comments um, and also Sharon Rudy's great question, too. And I think um, that this ability, teaching the ability to identify and adjust to different contexts um, would really be a, a wonderful way of describing the way I see global local, which is um, that there are global concepts that we need to teach our students, um, social determinants of health and this cross-cultural effectiveness and these things across national boundaries, um, but those need to be adapted locally. Um, and given context. And um, so I think this conversation is very relevant to the global issue. And um, ideally, I, I think that we need to work along Sharon Rudy's comment that we need, need to teach students how to contextualize issues and not to think that what they learn is only applicable in an international setting or a domestic setting. So, um, um, I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Virginia. Um, so other questions. Um, so Sarah Pakwe Margolis, sorry if I mispronounce your name. With the rapid expansion of MOOCs and online graduate programs, the challenges of learning cultural competency seem to be even more acute. What recommendations are being made for designing an assessing the practicum components of online global health training programs? Um, Ashley, I'm going to unmute you here. Because because I think you may have some something to contribute, um, as always. And Virginia and Quentin, also feel free to weigh in on MOOCs, MOOCs and virtual education. So assessing cultural competency in an online format, that's the question? Yeah, teaching and assessing as we go online with so much curriculum, how do yeah. we um, do that? It's, it's, it's been a challenge. It's something that we're uh, struggling with. We've used a lot of um, cultural competency modules and certificates. You know, Unite for Sight has some excellent resources that we've used as well as some other um, online uh, work. We tried to get our students to actually do some prospective work to sort of imagine in their practica they are going to be um, interacting with uh, different cultures to sort of think through what may be some of the cultural differences from what they've read. They spend a long, they spend a lot of time on the ground, kind of reading and trying to interact um, with whatever online media is available. And we try to get them to come up with scenarios that they think may be culturally challenging, and we tend to discuss them in um, in, in sort of group discussions, um, assessing how they will we'll be doing in the field really usually happens w when they are doing their practica, and we have online um, sort of weekly check-ins really around how they're integrating into their host culture and then also checking in with our host family. So it's, it's something we're, we're working through, um, and it's, it's not perfect, but that's, that's yeah. how we, and we've been using a lot of the theory that you've, you've discussed already, uh, Quentin, mm -hmm. a lot of yeah, uh, Thank I you. Would... I will point out mm -hmm. Go ahead. that ASHTI's program does have a practicum fieldwork experience. So that is, you know, unique because many MOOCs are exclusively online. And I also want to point out Erica Frank's work who uh, made a comment um, on this webinar that NextGenU, which is an open access online university, uses peer and mentored interactions to customize competencies and give trainees feedback on them. So to learn more about NextGen, you can visit their website. Go ahead, Quentin. No, no, I was just going to, you know, add that I think 
the notion of self-directed assessment seeking is, is a very interesting one, and I would urge you to explore that a little bit, and I can send you some articles on it, because it really means that the, you empower the, the um, trainee to be involved in their own assessment. Now, there is a move that says, oh, that can lead to overconfidence, and they overassess themselves, but that can be tempered by bringing in the other people on the ground that they're participating with and peers and community workers and you might want to develop a template in which they you see that they are doing all of that and that it's not just bringing it back to the home to the committee at home and discussing it but really very actively involves the, the, the people on the ground the problem with competencies is that they must at some level um, you know a competency is an outcome so it must be seen and observed at some level, cannot all be done as sort of knowledge that, that you read in a text and think you know it from, from that alone. There must be some element of actually interaction, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great questions. Anna, Anella Auer also points out, she's from PAHO and she's on the webinar, that PAHO WHO has done some work on competencies in conjunction with LMICs that are more context specific. So perhaps, um, Anella, you can those to CGH and we can distribute them. Um, many great comments and questions that we didn't get to. We will have the webinar slides available. I know that was a question that we got um, and you know with attribution I think using them as widely as possible is only helpful for our entire community. I do want to point out that CUGH is running a really exciting training um, in Washington, D.C. It's coming up February 29th through March 1st, and it's focusing on USAID, CDC, NIH, and financial compliance rules and regulations. It's going to be a very practical workshop um, that may apply to everyone. So go ahead and check out CUGH's website for more information as it's filling up. And again, this is from Jessica Everett, Quentin Eichbaum, Virginia Rothorn, Ashley DeBay Prasad, and CUGH. We thank you for joining us and caring so much about these important issues. Take good care. Thank you.